Welcome back to Winning Souls for Christ, a radio show designed to teach, equip, and empower you for the mission of the new evangelization. I'm your host, Isaac Longworth, and today we're going to be talking about something that I just find fascinating, Eucharistic miracles. Now, as you well know at this point, if you've been following along with this program, Winning Souls for Christ, you'll know that this program is all about evangelization equipping us to proclaim the good news about Jesus to the effect that someone is brought to saving faith in him. That's what evangelization is all about. So you might be wondering, what is the connection between evangelization and Eucharistic miracles? What's the connection? Well, I'll tell you what the connection is. In our modern time, many people have become skeptical to the claims of Christianity, and they've become closed off to hearing the message of the gospel because of their atheistic, materialistic worldview. They don't want to look at anything spiritual. They don't want to talk about things of the soul. They don't want to talk about the supernatural because they don't believe in it. They only believe cold, hard data, scientific research, facts empirical evidence. That's the only thing that they value. And so sometimes in order to evangelize someone effectively who's in this mindset, we need to jolt them out of this worldview by telling them about some of the miraculous, supernatural things that God is doing in our world today. Things like Eucharistic miracles. Now, you might be wondering, what's a Eucharistic miracle? Maybe you haven't heard of this term before. Well, a Eucharistic miracle is this. We know that as good Catholics, uh, at the moment of consecration in the Mass, the bread and wine are transubstantiated. They are changed in substance from bread and wine to substantially becoming the body and blood of of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happens at every Mass. But we also know that the accidents of bread and wine remain. And by that I mean, even though we know it's truly Jesus, it still looks like bread and wine. It still tastes like bread and wine. Well, what happens in a Eucharistic miracle is this. Through a divine intervention by God, not only does the substance change from bread and wine to body and blood, but the accidents change as well, meaning that it actually looks like human flesh. It actually looks like human blood. Now, there have been many such Eucharistic miracles that have happened all over the world throughout the history of the church in many different countries. Too many of them have happened, so we can't talk about all of them today. But I did want to talk about two very specific miracles because they, first of all, have an incredibly powerful story behind them, but also because of the high amount of scientific research and documentation that backs these two miracles up as real. And that way, if we know these stories, if we know these facts well, we will be able to share them with our atheistic, skeptical, non-believing friends and family. And it can have a powerful effect on them. It can shake them out of their materialistic suppositions. It can get them to question their worldview, question whether or not the supernatural, the miraculous God is actually real. And it can get them curious about our faith in a God who could work a miracle like this in the first place. So let's just dive right in and start talking about the first recorded Eucharistic miracle that has ever happened in church history. And this is the miracle of Lanciano, Italy. So it happened in the 8th century in a town that is now called Lanciano in Italy. And in Lanciano, there was a monastery that had been established. And one day, one of the monks from the monastery was celebrating Mass. Now, this monk in particular, he had some doubts about whether or not transubstantiation actually happened. He had some doubts that when he said those words of consecration, that Jesus was really made present there, body and blood. And so the Lord in his mercy decided to show this monk beyond a shadow of a doubt 
that he was truly present in the Eucharist because this time at this mass, after the monk had said the words of consecration, the host and the chalice filled with wine miraculously took on the appearance of human flesh and blood. So the host actually looked like human flesh and the chalice was filled with what looked like human blood. Now, the priest was shocked and surprised by this he went to the archbishop and the archbishop did an initial investigation of the miracle now bear in mind that this happened in the 8th century so a long time ago they didn't have all of the technological or scientific advancements to make in-depth studies of this miracle but he did what he could so this investigation took down the names and the accounts of all the witnesses who had seen the miracle take place they observed the flesh and they found that it looked the same as it was when it had first been miraculously changed into flesh, but that the blood had dried, had coagulated from its liquid form into five different globules of different sizes. Now within this miracle, they found a miracle within a miracle because they found that the globules of blood, even though they were different sizes and thus they should be different weights, they all weighed the same. In fact, if you put one globule on the scales, it would weigh the same as if you put all five of them together. So this became known as the miracle of weights. And after the investigation was done, the bishop had the host put back into a reliquary and it remained in this state until 1574, when a new bishop had more investigations done. So uh, they once again weighed the globules of blood and they found again that the miracle of weights was still occurring and that he did this in the presence of witnesses. They also found that even though the chalice and the reliquary had been there for 800 years, there was no visible decay either in the flesh or in the coagulated blood. And so they once again put the flesh back into the reliquary, they put the blood uh, back into the chalice, and it remained there until 1970, when Pope St. Paul VI had another investigation done. This was done by Dr. Eduardo Linoli. So Dr. Linoli was a professor of anatomy and pathological histology. So uh, it's a big scientific jargon there, but basically what Dr. Linoli did was he studied the microscopic anatomy of biological tissues and clinical microscopy. Dr. Linoli was the head physician of the hospital of Arezzo. And Dr. Linoli was assisted in his study of this miracle by a man named Dr. Ruggero Bertelli. And Dr. Bertelli was a professor of human anatomy at the University of Siena. So these are both very competent scientists and they did pretty thorough investigations of the miracle. And this is what they found they found that the flesh tissue had the structure of myocardium, which is the human heart wall. So the flesh wasn't just any flesh, it was flesh found in the human heart wall. And it also was made up of the endocardium, which is the membrane of fibrous elastic tissue that lines the cardiac cavity. So again, another part of the heart, different heart tissue. These have the same appearance as in the human heart. They found that in the miraculous flesh, there was no trace of preservatives that were found either in the flesh or in the blood, which is astounding that they are still in their great condition, considering that this first happened in the eighth century. They also looked at the blood. They looked at it and studied it very closely. They found that it was of human origin. They were even able to find the type. They found that it was type AB. And they found in the clotted blood that the proteins were normally fractioned with the same percentage ratio as those found in the seroproteic makeup of normal fresh human blood. So again, a lot of scientific jargon. I want to break it down for you. Basically, they found that the clotted blood had very similar chemical makeup as normal, fresh human blood. And this is astounding because this means that the blood appeared as if it were fresh and not 12,000 years old. 
So if the blood had been taken from a cadaver, if the blood had been taken from a dead body, it would have deteriorated rapidly. That's just how dead blood works. However, the samples that they studied from the miracle at Lanciano, even though they were centuries old, were free of preservatives and they'd never been sealed in an airtight way. Remember, they were kept in a reliquary. They were kept in a chalice for 12,000 years, not kept in an airtight sealed way. No preservatives. And yet the report found that the samples had the same properties as fresh human blood and flesh, the sacred body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Isn't that incredible that the Lord would give us this miracle that can be so thoroughly studied in order to prove the reality of who he is? It's incredible to me that this miracle that happened in the 8th century in the Lord's wisdom was kept all these years to be able to be studied by the scientific advancements that we have in our current time. So let this build up our own faith. We must never doubt the reality of the Eucharist, that every time we go to Mass, we receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus, that he is truly present there, even when we can't see him. But as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, this isn't the only Eucharistic miracle. There have been hundreds of them all over the world, too many to discuss in one show, but I did want to talk about one more. And this is one of the more recent ones. This one didn't take place in the 8th century. This one took place in 2008 in a place called Sokolka, Poland. So on October 12th, 2008, while a priest was giving out communion, he accidentally dropped a host. And so when he was notified that this took place, he interrupted communion and he took the host and he put it in a bowl of water that was beside the tabernacle because that's the proper way to deal with a fallen host because once you put it uh, in the water, it will dissolve over time and then you can pour the water out. That's the proper way to treat a host that's been dropped on the ground. Well, the nun of the parish who was a sacristan she took that little bowl filled with water and the consecrated host and she poured it into a bigger container that she filled with more water because she knew that it would take some time to dissolve an entire host and then she put that bowl of water in a safe in the sacristy now only she and the pastor of the parish had keys to that safe now a week later she returned to check on the status of the host and this is what she found as she opened the safe she smelt a smell of unleavened bread in the safe, which already was cluing her in that something interesting was happening. And when she looked in the bowl, she saw that in the middle of the host, which was still largely intact, even though it had been left in water for a week, what was in the middle of the host appeared to be a bloody piece of flesh. The host was bleeding from flesh tissue in the middle of the host. And even though there was blood, the water was still clear. It had been untainted by the blood. Again, similar to Lanciano, she didn't know what to do. So she went to the priest. He gathered some other priests. They all came and looked at it together and they decided the best thing to do was to go to the archbishop. They were unsure of what to do. And so they brought the archbishop. The archbishop looked at the miracle and he too was amazed by the sight. So he ordered that the host be removed from the water, that it would be put on a dry corporal, and that it would be transferred to a tabernacle for safekeeping. So that was in October. In January of 2009, the archbishop ordered that histopathological studies would be done on the miracle. So histopathological refers to microscopic examination of tissue. So looking closely at the tissue under a microscope to see what it was. So what they did was they took a piece of the altered host that had transformed into flesh. They took it and had it analyzed by two different doctors, uh, professors Maria Sobienich Latowska and Stanislav Solkowski. Now, both of these professors were medical doctors. And what they did was they studied the sample independent of each other 
in order to ensure the credibility of the results. They didn't want to impact each other's findings. They both studied their samples independently and then afterwards compared their studies and their findings. And both of them were histopathologists at the Medical University of Bialystok. So again, very competent uh, scientists, competent in their fields, doing intense scientific examination of the miracle to see just what was going on at the level of the tissues themselves. So these two doctors used state-of-the-art light and electron microscopes. And what they did is they photographed, they made detailed descriptions of their findings, they studied it intensely, again, independent of each other, and then brought their reports to the diocese. And this is what they found. They found that the undissolved part of the consecrated host, which was the part that still looked like bread, because remember, not the whole host had transformed into what looked like flesh. It was only a part of it. So the part of the consecrated host that still looked like bread had become embedded in the cloth. However, the red blood clot with the fleshy part was as clear as ever. It had not dissolved into the fabric at all. And they found that despite being submerged in water for a long period of time, both when it was in the bowl and also uh, when it had been switched to the other bowl, they found that the fleshly part of the transformed host showed none of the changes that would be expected from being submerged in water, but it was miraculously preserved. There was no water damage to the flesh at all, even though it had been soaking in water for over a week. They also found that the structure of the transformed fleshy portion of the host is identical to the myocardial tissue of a living person who is nearing death. So myocardial, again, is heart tissue. So just like at Lanciano, this is heart tissue. But in Sokolka, they found that the heart tissue was similar, actually identical, to that of a living person who is nearing death. And they were able to see that because there were small cracks called fragmentation that occur in heart muscle when it's at the point of death. And they found these tiny cracks in the tissue of the fleshy part of the miracle that evidenced this. Now, this could not have been done by human hands. This is a natural phenomenon that happens in the heart when a person is dying. So isn't that beautiful that the host transformed into the heart of Jesus as he was dying for us. That's kind of what they walked away from after investigating this miracle. They found that the structure of the heart muscle fibers is deeply intertwined and interpenetrated with that of the bread in a way that is impossible to achieve by merely human means, even with our most modern technologies. So they found that the bread and the flesh were intertwined with each other, that they had become one, that they were fibers, had been interpenetrated with each other, and this was not able to be done with any of our human technology. There was no way this could be achieved. This too was a miraculous thing that they found from their investigation. And in all of this, this led Professor Maria Sobianich Latowski to say this, these are undoubtedly the most important studies I have conducted in my life. The results were shocking to me. They point to an extraordinary phenomenon, which from a scientific standpoint is simply inexplicable. This is powerful stuff coming from a professor who is well-versed in scientific research, a really smart lady is looking at this miracle saying, science can't explain this. It's an extraordinary phenomenon. It's a miracle. The results have shocked me. Because of all this, the Metropolitan Curie of Bialystok, so this is the church hierarchy in the area, stated this, the Sokolka event is not opposed to the faith of the church. Rather, it confirms it. The church professes that after the words of consecration, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the bread is transformed into the body of Christ and the wine into his blood. 
Additionally, this is an invitation for all ministers of the Eucharist to distribute the body of the Lord with faith and care, and for the faithful to receive him with adoration. So this miracle in Sokolka has been approved by the local diocese. They hold it up as something that is not in opposition to what the church professes, that we truly believe that the Eucharist is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. And this should remind us to receive him with adoration, to remember that when we consume that Eucharist, we are consuming the Jesus who died for us. But we also need to remember when we're looking at these miracles that they're not just for our own building up of our own faith and devotion to the Eucharist, but they are a tool for evangelization. The Lord in his mercy is reaching out to the world with these supernatural signs, with these miracles, reaching out to us, imploring us to come to his mercy. He is extending himself out to the skeptical, to the atheist, to the materialist, saying, come and see the miracles that I work. Come to me and believe. And we need to use that to our advantage when we're evangelizing. When we share the scientific findings of these miracles, it can be a powerful way to shock a non-believer out of their worldview long enough to get them to consider the possibility that the Catholic faith just might be true. Now, why am I still speaking hypothetically? You might be listening to me and saying, why wouldn't everyone convert on the spot when faced with these astounding reports and many more like them? Why wouldn't everyone convert on the spot and become Catholic? And this is the mystery and the reality of free will. The reality that people still have a choice to reject Jesus. We can't force them to do it and we can't convince them merely by intellectual arguments and scientific findings of miracles. If they so desire, they will always be able to try and find another explanation, no matter how desperate it is. Or they could just flat out deny it and mock it. And the reality is, is that some people will do that. But there are others. There are some who are honestly seeking truth. They're honestly looking for truth and goodness and beauty. And especially those who are skeptical of many religious claims, when we share these miracles with them, it could have that effect that it could open the door to them receiving the gospel. So look up the miracles of Lanciano and Sokolka Poland. See the results. See the testimony of these scientists. Learn the facts and then present them to the friends and family members in your life who are skeptical of Christianity in order to break into them and expose them to the power of our God. Amen? Well, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time now, but hopefully something in this show has taught, equipped, or empowered you for the mission of the new evangelization so that you can go out and set the world on fire for Jesus.